welcome everybody. It is great to be here and see you all again. Welcome to our monthly podcast webinar uh, sponsored by the, uh, the American Schooner Association and the Great Chesapeake Schooner Race. We are joined here by uh, our two guests. We have John Bellino, who has cruised with me many, many miles over uh, one or two oceans, most recently all the way up to Gloucester, Massachusetts and back. And we have the incomparable Andy Shell holding his microphone as if it were his very first baby. So <laughs> things are good all around. And before we get going, I just want to lay out a couple of ground rules as we go. As we go, um, if you have any questions along the way, we have a Q&A box open, and that's the place to type your questions as you go. We'll hold your questions until we get to the end of Andy's presentation. And at that point, we will address them. We also have a chat box open. And the chat box should allow you to communicate directly to us uh, while this is running in perfect land. And I don't know if we can. Oh, the same panelists and to get a chat with. There we go. Having said that, I'd like to introduce my good friend, John Bellano. John, would you tell us just a little bit about you and uh, what the heck you're doing here, man? Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm John Bellano. And uh, right now I, I work at the Naval Academy's towing tank in the uh, Naval Architect and Ocean Engineering Department. And to get to my path to get to this point here in life uh, was uh, varied. I started out as a lobster fisherman, uh, worked in the Merchant Marine for a while, went active duty Navy, and then uh, was a sailmaker for a while, uh, did a lot of ocean racing, and wound back up with the government and the Coast Guard and the other Navy. And it's been a pleasure all along. Yeah, I see it, John. You've got one of the best jobs in the world, basically, Students walk into his lab, and John has to figure out what to do with the students who make up a project, right? Yep, essentially. Mighty cool. Mighty yeah. cool. And then we have my friend Andy Shell. And Andy and I used to sail together years ago before he became super famous. And uh, <laughs> he passed me many, many, many years ago, but still a great, great guy. And uh, Andy has since gone on to form a family and sail the world and Andy, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got here. Couldn't have done it without you, Duncan. Oh, please don't. Stop. Please we, don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I started working, uh, started professionally sailing on the woodwind um, with you and Jen and Ken back in 2006. Seems like a, a long time ago now. But uh, in fact, I always wanted to do ocean sailing and I credit one of our woodwind crew, actually. I don't remember, don't, don't know if you remember Pete. Um, he gave I me a book by cool. John. Yeah, yeah. He gave me a book by John Kretschmer. And I knew I always wanted to do something with sailing. And I was like, that's it. I want to go ocean sailing. And I basically tried to copy John, John Gretschmer's career ever since. That's uh, did some... cool. And I know you had a long background with your dad as well, right? Yeah. Well, he and I started doing ocean deliveries because I really wanted to do the offshore stuff as crew. And uh, did that for a few years. Ran the World Cruising Club. Did some cruising rallies with them. The Caribbean 1500 I was in charge of for five years or so. And then we bought a Swan 48 out of Annapolis and started 59 North, which was to take oh, p take paying crew on ocean passages. And today we have two boats, Falcon and Far 65, which I'll talk about a bit about today because that's the boat I did my trip on this summer. And then we've still got Eastbjorn, the Swan 48, which um, which was the original. And that boat's over in Norway, actually in Sweden right now, getting refit as we speak. But in, in that interim, since I started ocean sailing in 2007, I've clocked I, I stopped counting after 100,000 miles and seven transatlantics and a voyage up to 80 north in Spitsbergen and now this latest Greenland trip. So it's I, I've oh, done quite God. a bit. It's been, yeah. it's been fun. I, I, I'm I I'm very lucky. You are very lucky. It's crazy. I remember when you had uh, had your first boat at the yard and Andy was determined to do all of his running and standing rigging. And if I remember, it was all Amsteel. And so it's Still is that that first boat we sailed from Annapolis to Sweden in 2013, sold it to the new owner, and he still has it in uh, in Dyneema Ducks rigging. And my new family boat, uh, we have a Norlene 34 in Sweden, which is is also rigged in ducks. So I'm still a fan. Woo! That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Now, Andy, this summer you made an amazing trip, and of course that's the the point of this whole webinar. But uh, you were headed to Greenland. But more interestingly, the route you took was through the fjords of Iceland. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And then after that, we'll move into your pictures. 
Well, to get your geography right here, uh, Duncan, uh, I'm going to do my first screen share here. It's actually easier to show this on the map. Um, let's see here. If I do that and get you out of my email here, uh, can you see the, the website here, Duncan? I sure can. You bet. So, yeah. So our route led us from, here's the tracker. Actually, Falcon is currently at sea. So this page, you can see Falcon's just north of Horta. She's headed back to Portugal. But this shows you, I'll show you our full season in 2023. Yeah. So that's Falcon's route for the wow. just just this year. Oh, we, my God. <laughs> we rebuilt the boat in England. In uh, She was launched in January in the uh, on the south coast of England. This first little hitch down here, that was our sea trial. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine what a, a sea trial in January in the English Channel is like. You can we, had, we had hailstorms and 50 knots of wind. Um, but anyway, uh, we sailed down the coast of Portugal, across the Atlantic, all the way down here to Antigua. I wasn't on the boat for all these trips, by the way. Yeah. Um, up to Annapolis earlier this summer, and then I joined the boat in Annapolis. We went up through the C&D Canal, and on up, our first leg was to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, and then to, uh, many people don't know this, but there's actually a, a, a part of France here, just south of Newfoundland. So no St. Pierre and Miquelon is actually French, so we stopped there. Uh, up to St. John's, Newfoundland, and that's where we staged for the Greenland slash Iceland passage. So it was one crew, one passage from St. John's, Newfoundland through the fjords in southern Greenland, uh, which is what I'm mainly going to talk about today. You can see our inland passage there it was about 70 miles inland. And then we crossed the Denmark Strait up to northwest Iceland. So we made landfall up here in the west fjords of Iceland. Uh, so all told, that was, let's see, we can just zoom in on that track. Um, all told, that was 1,646 miles from St. John's to Iceland. I got it. <laughs> that was my trip. So noted where Iceland is now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we didn't quite... An interesting fact about Iceland. Everyone thinks Iceland's an Arctic country, and it is technically, but only because there's this tiny little island that's not even going to show up on this map. You can see that dotted line there is the Arctic Circle. I'll be there's a tiny little island just above the Arctic Circle yeah. right here. It actually does show up on the map. That yeah. little peninsula is the only reason that Iceland is technically an Arctic country. Everything else lies below the Arctic Circle. So fun oh. fact for your trivia there. God, how about that? Now, if I remember, Andy, your, your company, you're what I would call a, a high adventure voyaging company. And so you actually take paying passengers along. And could you describe how that works? Yep. So right now on Falcon, um, like I said, she's a we rebuilt an old race boat into our ultimate offshore passage boat. So we take eight paying crew and uh, two uh, staff. So a, a skipper, a mate. Sometimes we'll take an apprentice. In this case, we actually had a photographer on board. Those of you listening that that watch the YouTube sailing channels, we had James the Sailor Man on board. He has a, a boat called Tritea. He's single handed from L.A. to New Zealand on an Alberg 30. Oh so he uh, he came along to document this, and there's actually going to be some films coming out about it on his YouTube channel in January. So we were 11 total people on Falcon for this trip, and that's normally how we sail. Uh, and then the other boat, Eastbjorn, takes one skipper and five paying crew. So we set up a calendar. Actually, you can see here right on the webpage, uh, we just launched at Boat Show our 2025 calendar, and this shows the planned routes for 2025, which is actually how far out we book. So we're going across the Atlantic into the Pacific for the first time in 25, all the way to Tahiti, north to Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, and uh, and California. So that's that's pretty exciting news. We just announced that last week. Extremely exciting. And I got to tell you something funny here, Duncan. This on this map, there's a little icon of the Millennium Falcon. Um, <laughs> yes, I, <there> is. <laughs> I sneaked one in here because our boat is a far Millennium 65. It was built for the Millennium Round the World Race in 1999. And I badly wanted to name it Millennium Falcon, but uh, that got vetoed by the other half of the ownership at 59 North. Uh, so so in my mind, it's Millennium Falcon, but it her real name is me. Nordic oh, Falcon. It works for me. Yeah. And, uh, you're feeling the force, right? You're feeling That's the force. That's 100%. I love that. For anybody taking notes here, you can see Andy's uh, website up here is 59-north.com. That's it. All right, Andy, you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Let's show you. Show us what you got. All right. So I, I kind of talked about this a little bit. I was telling Duncan when we were setting up here, um, I've not given a presentation on this Greenland trip before. So you guys are getting a, a first look exclusive. And what that also means is I've got some video clips to share with you that have not been edited yet. 
So I'm going to narrate over some of the video clips and show you that. Mainly what I really want to talk about on this uh, on this event, I was not prepared. I, I got to preface this a little bit. I did a trip to Spitsbergen uh, on Eastbjorn in 2018. So that's our other boat. Spitsbergen is way the hell up here north of Norway. It's this archipelago, Svalbard archipelago. Spitsbergen is the big island. And that trip took years of planning, and it it was like – the top thing I thought I could ever do with my career at the time. And we did that trip. We made some movies about it. We made a book about it. It's well-documented. It was stupendous. And the glaciers and the polar bears and the wildlife and the scenery, I didn't think it could ever be topped. Well, <laughs> I think I topped it. Um, I, think I, think I was I was doing, speaking to John, John Kretschmer, he's become sort of a mentor for me. And uh, he did this same route. This is this is usually well known as the Viking route. And you can kind of do this route either from east to west or west to east. Obviously, the Vikings would have done it from east to west, from Europe to North America. Um, but he had done this Viking route last year. And I was talking to him. Uh, we were anchored in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, down uh, down here on the map. And we were, he was showing me some coordinates for some anchorages and some things to to think about. And I talked to some other people, uh, John Harry's of morganscloud.com. And like, it was all very practical, but nobody did a very good job of like explaining how stupendous and spectacular the scenery would be. And, uh, and I think that's what I, I feel like I have a mission now to, to really emphasize that. And I'm going to hopefully do that with, uh, with more photos and videos than like words. To, let me pause you just a second. For those of you who have joined us a little bit late, um, if you have any questions along the way or any comments, we have both the Q&A board open for you to use, and we also have comments running on this side. So if you don't see them, go to the bottom of your screens, find a Q&A button, and you'll also find a comment button. We'll answer these questions and address them uh, towards the end. Back to you, Andy. Thanks, Duncan. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll start with the map. We looked at this a little bit. Uh, my actual trip when I joined the boat uh, from was from Annapolis and having gotten to Iceland, it was, it's kind of like one of those surreal things where I got off the boat. We cleared customs in Issa Fjord, which was also our landfall after leaving Svalbard in that 2018 trip. And, uh, I was like, I can't believe I can actually sail from like sail all the way from Annapolis to Iceland. It just felt like sailing to another planet. Like this shouldn't have been possible. Uh, all told, it was over 3,000 miles, uh, the stint that I was on the boat. Again, like I said, in, in three legs. So we started this the, the Greenland leg here in St. John's. And St. John's, Newfoundland, it's one of those places where you really feel like you're at the end of the earth. It's a pretty big city, but it's a very industrial port. You can see by the map here, there's there's no marinas. You're just tied alongside to the other fishing boats. And it's a really cool place to start a, a big adventure like this. It feels like... It wouldn't just it would just wouldn't feel right if you were starting a trip like this from a, you know, a, a, an all inclusive yacht marina. Um, and I always like to start any trip, especially when you're going offshore. I always like to start any trip at anchor. Uh, but you can see here that's a pretty steep coastline around St. John's and not a lot of protected anchorages, depending on what the wind and swell is doing. But I was looking on the chart and this little bay down here. Um, looked reasonable. You can see how steep the cliffs are on the side here. And actually, this is um, this was pretty nice because we had an east, a light wind, east wind, and I thought we could get in there. So we we actually moved the boat outside of St. John's and down to here. And that's the first video I'm going to show you, just to give you some context of what the attitude was like with the crew on board the boat. So this is a quick drone tour of that first anchorage in um, outside St. John's. Duncan, can you see this? I yeah, I can, Andy. Go ahead. Awesome. All right, here we go. There so goes. normally my vi normally my edited videos have sound to them, but I, like I said, this is a first look exclusive. So this was that little bay here. That's a a little freshwater pond behind there, and you can see it's it's one of those places that you know we were less than a mile as the crow flies from the city of St. John's, uh, but we had this place all to ourselves. This was really neat too because there's tons of wildlife up here. So we're sitting in the cockpit eating taco. Uh, it's, our, it's like one of our pre-departure traditional meals on the boat. And there's humpback whales spouting all around us. There's puffins swimming around the boat. Uh, and it was we just had a, a wildlife show as we were sitting there eating our tacos. So this gives you an idea of what the scenery was like when we left St. John's. And we had, I think the first leg to Greenland was about 800 miles um, to get up, up past Labrador and into Greenland. <clears throat> uh, 
And St. John's, the entrance St. John's Harbor is just around the left there amongst those hills. So it's pretty protected, but we actually had, we had the wind shifted overnight. We had a north wind that blew in this bay. So we had to get up and leave kind of in a hurry. Um, but this was a nice spot, a nice spot to, to start an offshore passage away from the dock and kind of start to get your sea legs before you actually have to start a watch routine. So I'm going to go back to the map here for a second and give some context to the uh, pictures I'm going to show shortly. So we left St. John's. And what happens here, as you come up through the Labrador Sea, this passage was a, a combination of challenges, uh, both with weather and with ice. Um, when I was up in Svalbard in 2018, we had ice, glacier ice to deal with up there, but it was never dark. So you were above, well above the Arctic Circle in the summertime, so the sun never set. So the ice was a challenge, but the darkness on top of it was not a challenge. So this was kind of, I felt like, a level more difficult getting to Greenland because you've got two bits of ice navigation to deal with. Right off the bat, you've got the Labrador current that's that kind of curves e uh, south-southeast along the Labrador coast here and around the tip of Newfoundland. And we actually had, there were some icebergs on the charts right around just outside of St. John's here. And when I was up in St. John's in 2021 on Ice Bear, we had icebergs all the way up this coast. So that was challenge one is like getting away from the continent here and out into clear water. We saw our first iceberg at sea, probably somewhere around here before this kink and that initial band of ice. And, and there's some charts you can get to, to look at this. That initial band of ice was maybe 300 miles wide and then you're in the clear. So yeah. once we got clear of that, you know, you could relax a little bit more offshore. Mm -hmm. This little kink was an interesting, um, well, that was a wind shift. Sorry, the second kink in our path. This was the second sort of obstacle in getting to Greenland because we had another band of ice, much denser ice off the coast of Greenland for about 60 miles. So my challenge was to get the boat, first of all, at the outer reaches of that band in daylight. So it was timing our, our landfall to get to the outer reaches of that band in daylight. That was step one. Step two was hopefully it wouldn't be foggy. Uh, we couldn't control that. And then step three was to try to get to windward of to, to get a windward position so that as we were navigating across this ice band, we could do it in daylight, hopefully in good visibility and basically sailing on a reach in order to give ourselves the most maneuverability. And what happened here with this little kink is we had a wind shift. The wind went north and we were close hauled. And you can see here that kink out to the e northeast was our course. And the wind was going to stay sort of east northeast for a while. And if I had continued sailing, we were going to get set way to the east over here by Cape Farewell, sort of downwind of where I really wanted to be, where our landfall was. And we were going to get there in the dark if I didn't change tactics. So this little kink here is actually we hove to. We hove to for like 12 hours because um, we knew the wind was going to shift back again to the east. And then we got really lifted once we got underway again where the line starts going north. We got lifted and we managed to get to here, a really nice windward position for that last stretch across the way here, where it allowed oh, us to slow the dog you. <laughs> What's that? You lucky dog you. It wasn't luck, it was planning. That's my point. <laughs> so we got we got into a windward position. We were able to we our my my tactic was like, all right, we're gonna keep sailing fast. And we were going Falcon goes fast on a beam reach. We we're doing like 10 knots, it was blowing 25 knots. And I said, I'm going to keep sailing fast until we see our first target on the radar. And sure enough, the only reason, the only unlucky thing was it was literally the densest fog we had on the entire 800 mile passage. You could barely see past the end of the boat. So I said, all right, first target on the radar, we're going to shorten sail and slow down. So we went down to three reefs on the main sail, staysail up um, and put a, posted a, a lookout on the bow. And it was pretty spooky because you've got all these barrier islands out here and you've got when we, we saw the first uh, what do they call it? A bergy bit, which is like a, you know, a car sized chunk of ice. That's not going to show up on radar. And when we spotted that for the first time, we thought, okay, well, at least we know what to look for now. This is a little, a little, uh, makes us a little more comfortable because you can at least see it with enough room to maneuver the boat. Uh, I'm going to jump out of the map here and show some pictures of what this looked like. Um, in reality here. So excuse me again for my, uh, willy nilly. I'm going to, here you go. So this was, this was, um, can you see that picture there, Duncan? Is that full screen? Uh, <clears throat> it's standing up with the other one side by side right now. Okay, sorry. Let me... Uh, I double click. 
Hang on a second. Let me do something different here. I'm going to do, let me stop the screen share. Stand by, guys. Technical, technical stuff. These webinars. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Hang on one second. It's okay. It's going to work out just fine. What an amazing passage. My God. All right. This is going to be better. Let's start. Let's, do, right. some, let's do a screen share here where we're just going to, just going to share the, uh, the photo app. All right. Go for it. Okay. So first of all, that should be full screen now. Yeah. Yep. Looks great. All right. Super. So this was our, this was what the weather we had before the fog. This is, believe it or not, in the middle of the Labrador Sea. Yeah. Um, really, really beautiful. You know, if it wouldn't have been for the cold weather, you, you would have thought we were in the South Pacific or something. So um, we had a full moon. That's, um, gosh, I'm not going to remember people's names now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this one's Richa. That's Richa at the helm of the full moon. She actually sailed with me to St. John's uh, two years before when we were on Ice Bear and saw the icebergs. And this was the setup coming in. Um, we we're going super fast, getting ready to make landfall. And sure enough, the fog starts rolling in. This is Charlotte on Ice Watch. This gives you a bit of a sense of what the visibility was like. Couldn't see much. And you can see just here, if you look in the left corner of your screen, you can see a tiny, tiny little bit of ice there just at the edge of the fog limit. Yeah, I got that. That's yeah. what we were looking for. So this was the scene as we were making our approach. And the neat thing about Greenland is you can see, I mean, normally on a clear day, you can see Greenland's mountains from 60 miles away. And uh, we didn't see any of that. <laughs> So it was a little, little bit anticlimactic, but it was cool because we had, you know, everybody was, was excited to see icebergs and we got to see that and stuff. So that was cool. I'm um, going to skip ahead here. Our first landfall. So basically, we came out of the fog as we approached through those barrier islands. Fog clears because the, the land is warm. And this was kind of the first sight out of the fog. You can see oh, Falcon yeah. there. <laughs> There's our first big iceberg that we actually saw. Now, we had numerous targets on the radar. We never saw any of them. And this was our first harbor. There's a little village called Nanurtalik, which is about 30 miles up the coast to the west from where the entrance to the Prince Christian Sound is. And we thought if we had time, we'd go in there first and just have some civilization. But uh, before we did that, we had a little bit of a, a recce over here to find some ice. And, and that's what the mist looked like as we came inshore. That's an um, astounding picture, Andy. This was our first iceberg, actually, that we saw on the trip. There's, there's what it looked like from above. Um, neat thing, too, about about the ice in Greenland is in Svalbard, you're amongst the glaciers. You're, you can get right up close to the glaciers. And because of that, the water is really silty and milky and not clear at all. So you never got to see this sort of underwater profile of the ice. But here in Greenland, because the ice drifts so far away from the glaciers, you, you get this crystal clear water and you can really see what the ice looks like underwater. It's pretty spectacular. That's astounding. Um, the first little village we tied up at the at the fishing pier. This was Nanurtalik. That's the back the backdrop on the village. It's just like, oh boy, we actually made it to Greenland. Like this, this is what we're getting. Like holy smokes. Um, there's a little zoomed out picture. We were kind of tied up on a wharf. The tides here were very very high, so we were having to manage dock lines and stuff. And at low tide, you had to climb down this ladder on the wharf. I mean, you were probably 12 feet above the deck of the boat at low tide. And at high tide, the boat was level with the parking lot. So that was a little bit bizarre. Um, and then we had some neighbors. There were two other sailboats in uh, Nortalik when we got there across the way. Um, so we got to got to spend some time with them and get a little briefing from them. We only spent one night here because we really wanted to get out to do more of uh, more of this kind of stuff. Um, so I was saying, like, I talked to Kretschmer and I talked to a couple other people. <laughs> and I'd found, I'm going to go back to the map here for a second. I'd found a uh, Kretschmer had talked about an anchorage, which, you know, our company is at is called 59 degrees north because that's where I live in Sweden. That's the latitude of Stockholm. Um, but, you know, it was Kretschmer's like, this is an anchorage made for you guys. Uh, there's an anchorage at 59 degrees, 59 minutes north. And it's not charted because it's it's off the charts, but it's this little basin right over here. If you can see yeah, that on the map. And we got some local knowledge from Kretschmer and from some people that have been in here. Uh, all these, the fjord, the main area of the fjords are all pretty well charted and they're so deep, it hardly matters. But there was some, some interesting navigation to get in here. But I was like, okay, an anchorage at 59 degrees, 59 minutes north, we have to go there. So we left Nanortalik, came down through these barrier islands. Um, that photo that you had in the, in the seminar introduction of me with an iceberg in the background, that was down through here. It was a very pleasant, light downwind sail through these islands. No swell because you're really well protected. Icebergs all around. 
Um, and then once we got into the fjord system, the the fog cleared. And I'm going to show you. Kretschmer said it was the all time greatest anchorage he's ever been in, and uh, I'm not one to argue with him. So I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you a couple photos of that first, and then I'll pop out and show you a video. Uh, there's the anchorage. There's Falcon. We had hiked up to the top of the hill. And it was super well protected. One of the things you got to worry about, which I'll talk about towards the end of this chat, is you get in these less protected bays and there's so many icebergs around that you often have to move to avoid the ice interfering with your anchor chain or the boat itself. But this was one where this was the only anchorage in Greenland where we didn't have to do anchor watches because it was so well surrounded by by land that ice wasn't going to get in there. Uh, let's see if I have a better picture here. Um. Here, I'm going to pop out and show you a video of this anchorage. And this was like, you got to remember, like this was like the first day of being in the fjords in Greenland. And everybody was just like absolutely blown away. Must have been. Um, yeah, you bet. So let me uh, let me show you the, what the video of this looks like because the picture doesn't do it justice. Neither does the video for that matter, but uh, we'll do our best. So again, this is the uncut drone footage, but there you go. That was the entrance to the anchorage. Not, none of this was charted, so we had a guy in the spreaders looking for stuff. The water was so clear, you could see the underwater rocks. You can see some ice out in the distance there. That's our dinghy off to the left of the screen going ashore. And these peaks in the background here are um, like 3,000 feet straight out of the water. Gee whiz. Uh, so this is this is the kind of thing. I mean, it truly, truly feels like you're at the end of the world here, and there's there's just nothing here. We're 30 miles from that Nanortalik village, and... Um, you, you just have the place to yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> so there goes the, the, the dinghy with the first shore party heading ashore. And I'm going to zoom, cool. you can watch that. zoom ahead. You can see how clear the water is. I mean, mm. the dinghy is at the edge of the basin there and the water, that water, even where it's shallow, there's probably 12, 15 feet deep and it's, it's Caribbean clear. I mean, it's really, really spectacular. Or there's nothing growing on those shores. Is there? No, but there's flowers. There's some flowers in Greenland. No, uh, not really any wildlife. I'll tell you what, though. There's Matt Rutherford, who spends a lot of time in Greenland, warned me about this. There is a lot of mosquitoes. I will tell you that. <laughs> um, let's see here. So, so that was our first anchorage. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to the map now and give you some context to where we were at here. So we the the thing with these passages and that this is like as cool as what we do is we really only get a very short amount of time in all these amazing places. I mean, we only spent, I think, five days in Greenland, which like doesn't do it justice. And you can see how many, I mean, look at the coast here. It's just indented with, I mean, you could spend a lifetime up here and never see it all. So I'm just scratching the surface, but basically we left this anchorage. You can see we forgot to turn the tracker on. <laughs> we did not actually go over the, uh, the mountains there. Oh, uh, one more thing I got to show you here, actually. We, so we climbed up this ridge here. Uh, and took some pictures. The cool thing about this ridge is we could see to the other side. And I got to just share some of those uh, some of those pictures with you quick. Um, because this was again, this was like all brand new to us, and it was just stupendous. Where's my other? Yeah, here we go. Getting good at I'm getting good at this uh, screen sharing back and forth. It's I got showing, it's showing. Yeah. So this oh. this was the top of the hill adjacent to our anchorage, and you could see just forever in the waterways that you can kind of see behind us. That's where we'd be heading the next day. So oh. me and uh, so Vilma, the the girl on my left, is um, she was my first mate, the one in the middle, and then it was Matt and Charlotte who uh, who took the hike up there. Um, we had a little fun at the top. <laughs> that's which which way does the sun rise in the east which way does it set in the west oh i thought they were going to walk like an egypt uh <laughs> we could do that yeah back and forth so uh so that was i mean ever like the thing you, you get into these places and it's just like it's so mind-blowing that you just don't want to sleep it's just yeah. like all right how much time can i spend up here and how often can i do this so all right let's pop back out to the map because what what you have here is this fjord system is 70 miles wide, basically from the entrance down here to the exit over here at the other end. Um, but there's not really any place to stop. So we left the anchorage, came back out the way we came up this channel here, and then you can follow the yellow brick road here down and around. And this was all motoring. We we were blessed. The thing with Greenland is you, if you get fair weather, you get a high pressure that sits right over the tip of Greenland. 
and there's crystal, crystal clear skies and no wind at all. And if there is any wind, it, it's going either up the fjord or down the fjord. Um, yeah. And you wind away, wind around these bends a bit. So we basically did this entire passage in one day. So all the photos and videos I'm about to show all happened in one day. And then at the other end down here, this is where I said you had to move from the ice. We started over here, bounced over here and kind of sat here for three days waiting for weather before we went across the went across the Denmark Strait to uh, to Iceland. So I'm just going to run through some um, some photos first and then we'll do some more video of some of the stuff we saw in the fjords there. Um, let's see. All right. <clears throat> Some of these are going to be a little bit out of order, but that's okay too. Um, so there's another view of that first anchorage. And again, these peaks, cliffs in the background are like 3,000 feet tall right out of the uh, right out of the ocean. I've got a video of this. This was really spectacular where we, you, closer to the ocean, you had the sea mist kind of roll in. But once we got inland a few miles, the fog lifted, and this was kind of right at the edge of that. I've got a really cool video about this. But this cliff to the right of the screen here, you can just see the boat down in the fog, was literally straight out of the ocean and 5,000 feet tall. Like oh, it was man. just, it was just unbelievable. Good grief, Andy. Um, here's a, here's a good picture of that cliff in the background. So that's, uh, that's Jim. Jim actually sailed with us all the way from Annapolis, all the way to Iceland and beyond, all the way to Ireland. So he was uh, on the boat all summer this year. But that's that 5,000 foot cliff, like out of the ocean all the way up. And like guys climb this stuff. If, if you guys are taking, those of you taking notes, Google a, a video series called Vertical Sailing in Greenland. Bob Shepton, who's this, uh, he's in his yeah. 80s now. He's a reverend, and he does, he's does. he been a climber and and takes guys up here on his 33-foot westerly, and they, oh. climb, they climb stuff like this straight off the boat. I mean, and it is just, it is wild. Um, let's see here. There we go. Here's, uh, this is this is James, the sailor man. So James was um, our videographer. And that's him on the coffee grinder on Falcon. And then this is him up the rig spotting for both icebergs and shallows as we made our way into that first uh, anchorage. Um, jumping ahead, this was the weather station at the east end of the fjord. So this is basically, this is the day we left because that big iceberg had come in the anchorage, broken up into pieces and was starting, it, it, was, kept, it, make, it was making like laps around the anchorage. Uh -huh. uh on the currents so we said okay we got to move but um the anchoring up here i forgot to say the shallowest anchorage we had was like 70 feet i think uh so it was and full of kelp so it was pretty challenging anchoring conditions but as you can see we had pretty stable weather so it was okay but this is an old uh, weather station at the east end of the of the fjord system and it used to be manned and they have some infrastructure there but now it's all automated and um it felt like if you ever played like Nintendo 64, the GoldenEye James Bond game, it felt like a like a James Bond set. Like it was all these like white satellite globe things all around and suspension bridges and rickety old steps and and decrepit buildings and stuff. It was pretty neat. And nobody's home there, right? No, nobody home. I think there's people there once a year or so. Wow. Um, there's another boat in the background there on the dock. We met this Contessa 32 in the fjord uh, and they were basically sailing everywhere. And they asked us, I, we passed them, I said, because they didn't have any fuel uh, oh. on purpose. They were like true sort of, you know, uh, what do you call it? They were, they were like real. Right. Um, yeah. 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 So, so we, uh, we offered them a tow and they came over. They had a big, they had a yellow golden retriever on the boat too. So they, we pulled them, a, pulled them behind the Falcon and I motored like 20 miles down the fjord to save them a day and a half of tacking around in no wind. And they brought their dog over for a, for a little coffee on Falcon as we were towing them. Um, here you go. That's the uh, there. You can just see Letitia in the background, the dog in the cockpit, and the rest of the the gang hanging out as we're towing them down the last stretch of the fjord. Very nice. I think I shared this picture. I'm not sure if you shared this or not in the thing, but the coolest picture of the whole trip was was this drone shot. That's yep. looking down the last 30 miles of the fjord. So you can just see Falcon in between those two big pieces of ice. I had the drone at 1500 feet, which is as high as it would let it, it as high as it would go. Like you can't, it can't go any higher. And, uh, and it, I just sat it there and I mean, you can see what we were looking at in there, why it was so stupendous, the scenery and what you're seeing here on the water, it looks like a tide line or something there. That's all small pieces of ice. And just around the corner, um, in this little bay here, there was a glacier that actually was calving into the sea. So that's where all that ice was coming from. And we navigated through that. 
And actually, this is a good segue because I've got some really cool videos of both this view and uh, and something I'll share uh, in that fjord there or in that uh, glacial bay. Let's see what you got here. So, all right. So, let's see. So this one's uh, this. I I just did some file names before to prep for this, and this one's called High Altitude Panorama. So this is that same shot from the drone, but as a video. And this gives you, um, I just do kind of a, a circle to give you a sense of what everything looked like in that area. It's pretty amazing that you can do this with a, you know, a thousand dollar handheld drone like that. Yeah. You can get this kind of footage. It's really something. You can see a hanging glacier up there in the valley in the stream that comes down. That's yeah. climate change for you, by the way. That should normally or what that would have not that long ago been down to the sea. Um. You can see there that silty water I was talking about. So there's another yeah. glacier moraine over here and a glacial runoff. That's that. That's what happens to the water. It creates this cloudy water that you can't see through. So stark. And uh, yeah, as as you can see, despite the name, there's not much green in Greenland. But there's more than more than nothing, but not very much. <laughs> there's, another, there's another hanging glacier way up at the top of the video there, off to the right. You can see the waterfall coming down off of that. So pretty, pretty spectacular scenery. And this is like, I was like, why didn't John tell me about this? Like, I mean, I knew it was going to be cool, but like, this was just really something. Yeah, you bet. Uh, let's open up another one here. Um, we've got, okay, so this is probably my favorite, favorite video of the, of the whole trip. And I've got, uh, you know, let me stop this one. I've got sound on this one. So, you know, Duncan, you've seen at our boat show booth, my friends and I started this little side business called Harbor Burn Cannons. Incidentally, Duncan, the Harbor Burn comes from doing a Harbor Burn on the woodwind back oh in the day. God. What a scary thought. <laughs> so this was the uh, this was that glacier that was just around the corner. And the cannons, it's a black powder cannon. And this the sound they make when they echo off of walls is like really cool. And I knew it would be cool, but like I was unprepared for this. So let's see if we have sound in this. And uh, you can hear this cannon, the cannon echo in the in the walls here. Uh, let's see if I'm, oh, wait a second. I think I need to do the sound thing. Here we go. Share sound. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. Okay, back at it. Here we go. The ca So the cannon is mounted on the primary winch here in the cockpit, and uh, it's aimed at the glacier. I was, oh, sorry. Oh, my God. <laughs> did you hear it? Did you hear that or not? It came in late. Back it up a little bit. All right. Me. That's what I thought. Yeah, here we go. I had my sound muted on my computer. Here, let's let's try it again. Fire in the hole. <laughs> oh, oh fantastic. I got it. I got it. That was unbelievable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, my you missed. Amazing. <laughs> oh my god. That was by far the best cannon shot ever. Did you hear that? Yeah, we got it on video too. Should we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite thing. Should we do it again? Absolutely. So I don't have any fun at my do job, Duncan. It's really it's a bore. Too bad. It's, it's too yeah, bad. It's, what you do sucks so much. It's really tough. Oh. Uh, so that was pretty fun. Uh, a couple more videos here to emphasize the scenery. I'm going to show. Uh, hang on a second. Um, let me get this fired up. So that cliff uh, I taught I showed you guys about with the fog. Um, this is the one. So this was pretty neat. Um, also pretty disconcerting when you fly the drone above the fog and you can't actually see it. So you're really mm -hmm. only operating on the camera. There's no sound in this one. But I actually flew it into this little crevice in the wall and temporarily lost control because I lost connection with the controller. But this is that 5,000 foot cliff wall. And we kind of had brought Falcon over because I'd seen that vertical sailing Greenland where they actually use the boat as the start of their climb. And I was like, I just want to see what that would feel like, like being here. Like, let's see how yeah. close we can get the boat to the wall. And I mean, we only got within probably two boat lengths, but just the the scale of it, like I can't, I mean, just being there was amazing. And then thinking that these guys actually like parked their boat on that cliff face and that was the start of their climb. There you can see Falcon coming out of the fog now. 
Oh. And we got we'd gotten a little bit closer than this um, at a different point away from the video. Yeah. But like those guys that did that climb, it wasn't on this wall, but it was on a similar sized big wall. They were on the wall for 12 days. And like B- Bivy sat, you know, Bivy camping on a portal yeah. ledge and yeah. Bob Shepton, meanwhile, is down on his boat, just like motoring around the fjords for 12 <laughs> days while these guys are on the wall. So yeah. it was uh, it was pretty cool to like one of those things where you see something in a movie and it's like, I'm going to go there and see it for myself. It was this was probably like the most satisfying part of the trip for me just because of that, because I'd I'd really seen, you know, those videos came out a long time ago and I was like, that would be so cool to see that. And we got to see it. Unbelievable. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Um, all right. I am realizing that it's time goes so fast when you do this, Duncan. It does. Um, it does. It does. So we're gonna skip ahead here. Uh oh, I gotta show you. So the <laughs> the um all right, two two pretty cool videos. Uh another one here. Can you see this one with the iceberg in the foreground? Not yet. I've got Okay, your- hang on. I think I gotta I gotta actually reshare it here. So again, not having any fun at my job, um, figuring, hey, there's a there's a U-shaped iceberg. I should fly the drone through that little valley. That would be cool. Of course. So you can look in the background, too. There's a cruise ship coming down. That was kind of one of those things. You think you're at the end of the earth, and here comes a cruise ship. But, you know, I guess more people that see this, the better. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, we were messing around with the drone here. And it's so nice. When it's nice weather like this, you can just play around and have fun. And it's the same feeling we had in Svalbard, where it's just like, you you kind of feel like you're on edge all the time from the ice and the weather and the snow. But then when you're there, it feels like you're in this giant adult playground when the weather's nice. Got uh, so that was, that was pretty cool. Now, are you driving by looking through the camera of the drone? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Looking through the camera of the drone. Now, when we, when I land the drone, we land it like an, on an aircraft carrier. So we keep Falcon moving straight and we bring the drone at the stern. But if you fly it forward to land, the sensors don't let you get close enough to catch it. So basically, we bring it in from a stern, spin it around, and then I'm flying it by line of sight because I have to bring it in backwards. The camera's yeah. facing the other direction. But we got uh, me and my friend James started doing this drone stuff off the boats back in Scotland in 2017. And uh, I was telling you earlier, we got pretty good at it. I've never lost one at sea, but I've lost one at the dock and I've lost one at anchor. Um, <laughs> one of those things you, you pay more attention when you're uh, when you're at sea than you do at the dock. And that was kind of dumb. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then uh, last little Greenland video here. This was pretty cool. Um, this was we um, when we picked up the tow, we picked up Letitia under tow. Yeah, I was like, well, we have to get a We have to get a drone shot of this. So that's 65 foot Falcon pulling Contessa 32 Letitia and their dinghy uh, through this just astounding scenery. That was the glacier in the background where we shot the cannon. Um, so we basically did this for about four hours, towing them all the way down to that weather station where we both staged to wait for weather to get across Denmark Strait. So this was uh, not something you see every day, I think, up there. That's the good Samaritan in you. That's it. That's right. And you can see the wind. At, like they were trying to sail and the wind was super light. And like they'd been sailing all the way through this whole fjord system and they were foraging food, like picking mussels and stuff. This young Cana- French Canadian couple, super nice, super cool. Um And, uh, but I was like, Hey, you know, you guys want to tow? And I think we saved them probably three days to go 20 miles because there was no wind. (laughs) So current running through there. Yeah, there is some current running through there. Not a ton, um, for the, for as high as the tides go up and down, there's not that much current. Yeah. Um, not, not nothing we had to kind of work around or anything. Um, so, all right. So let's go back to the map. So, uh, at the end of, at the end of the fjord system, we're here at this weather station, and this is where I said we we were waiting for weather. We had this huge low pressure system. So the thing is, when you do this passage from a planning perspective, you typically have prevailing southwesterlies for this first stretch, um, which is what we had. We were only close hauled for this little bit here, and then we hove to. But the second bit, you've got prevailing northeasterlies because Iceland Iceland generally has a low pressure sitting right over top of it. So you get this counterclockwise rotation with this sort of stationary load that sits over Iceland and it funnels and accelerates down Denmark straight here between Iceland and Greenland. Mm. So you kind of have to, and there was this giant low sitting kind of right over Reykjavik that was moving off to the Southeast really slowly, but it was blowing like 45 knots out here in the middle for several days. And where we were in Greenland was what it looked like in those pictures. It was beautiful weather, but I was like, let's, let's not go out there. 
just yet. And we saw um, we had a, another little German cruise ship came in the fjord right when we were getting ready to leave. Actually, the day we were going to leave, I called them up on the radio. I said, what's it actually doing out there? And they're like, well, it's 30 knots from the north with six foot seas. And I was like, I think uh, we'll wait another day. Yeah, no kidding. So uh, so we waited one more day. Um, and again, I have no fun at my job. So I have to just share this one more photo here. Oh, a couple more I missed here in this. Um, let me make sure I have the right one up. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, along the theme of not having any fun at my job, um, <laughs> while we're waiting for weather, again, we had beautiful weather in Greenland. Every night we had this. We had Northern Lights. Oh, right my over God. Green. And um, it was like, and we nobody was expecting that because like being up in Spitsbergen, it never got dark. So you're way up north, but you don't even think about it. So it never occurred to me that we might get to see Northern Lights. And sure enough, like we're going to bed and I'm looking at the stars. You know how you do when you, you're on anchor and you 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 kind of like look around again before you go to bed. And I'm like, guys, I think I see the Northern Lights. And we had a pretty spectacular show almost wow. every night. We saw it at sea a couple of times, too, which was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but then we were kind of killing time and an iceberg floated through the anchorage. And I had had it in my head that it would be really cool to swim with an iceberg. And we had a dry suit <laughs> on the boat. And I go through this. I go through this. um this thought process sometimes where I get an idea in my head and like at the time I was supposed to be resting. We were going to leave the next morning and I'm like, I'm, I need to rest. And then I'm like, you know what? Shit, that thoughts in my head. I'm not going to be able to get that out of my head until I do this. In my wet suit. Yeah. So I got the dry suit out. I got the neoprene hood. I got the whole thing. I tied, I had a safety line tied around my ankle and, and this was a pretty small iceberg. The danger with this is that they can roll as they melt. But this one was really flat. Most of it was under the water in the first place. So I couldn't resist. So I jumped in and took a GoPro over and swam around and and uh, and got to swim with an iceberg. So that was that was pretty, pretty cool experience. Very cool. Yeah. So um, I, ha I, I like back to the map one last time here to give some more context before I show our landfall. I don't have many <laughs> pictures from Iceland or from at sea, but we had perfect weather when we left. You, like I said, you could see Greenland for 60 miles in the back behind the boat. It was really, really spectacular. We had to, we got out here and you can see this sort of flat spot. At some point in there, we had to heave to again. We, the wind had died down. It was still blowing about 25 knots from the Northeast, but the waves were like the worst, literally the worst waves I'd ever seen offshore. They weren't that big, but they were, as they call in the Baltic, they were square. And Falcon's a fast boat upwind. She's got a pretty performance shape. So she would like launch off the back of this wave yeah. and, and the ocean would just disappear and you come crashing down and the whole boat would shudder. Yeah. And I said, you know, F this, this is, this is going to break something or break, at least break our spirits. So we hove to again, I think this time for about, I think actually the heave two was over here further East uh, for about 18 hours. And, um, and then the wind kind of the waves laid down, the wind eased off. And then we were treated to a really spectacular. Um, so to give you context, Reykjavik is down here. Yeah. Reykjavik's the capital of Iceland, but we were headed for the West Fjords. So once we got over to this, this last straight line, we had about a probably a 60 mile from the edge of the. So this was like a motorboat ride. And then we got to here, the edge of the West Fjords. We went in real close because it was we were motoring just to get a good view. And then the wind started filling in from the southwest. And from here all the way to the entrance to isa fjorder we had like a 60 mile spinnaker run and it was probably the best spinnaker run of my career especially given the given the circumstances having just done this like really big passage doing greenland and i got some cool video of that which i'll show you here to wrap this where up the, uh, that's where you got the pink uh, spinnaker shot that's right and this was also the first time that we had the pink kite up because that kite was made for us and shipped to annapolis and we had gotten a, a carbon fiber spin pole from a Swan 66 that had been waiting for us in Annapolis. So this was the first time I'd ever flown this pink kite under like stupendous conditions. Um, that's the West Fjords in the background. And uh, it, this was how we finished the trip. And I think we were at sea from Greenland to Iceland for maybe, I think it was four or five days. It was like another 800 miles. So to be able to finish a passage like that with with this was just amazing. And we had perfect wind. It was probably bowling like, 10 to 12 knots um, to give you the, uh, a sense of size that spinnaker john you as a sail maker will appreciate this that spinnaker's 3000 square feet um <laughs> and and it was blown 10 to 12 knots yep. falcon falcons doing 10 knots boat speed and uh we had i think we saw like one knot apparent on the apparent wind gauge which i thought was really cool as we're going 10 knots 
incredible. Just incredible. So what a way to finish. We we made landfall. We we hit the dock in East of Fjorder at 2 a.m. Iceland Customs was waiting for us on the dock. Super friendly. We got cleared in in like a half an hour. Stayed up till 4 a.m. till the sun came up drinking champagne and whiskey. And everybody went to sleep, uh, sleep happy. It was a it was a hell of a trip. I'll tell you what. It was um, it was I think at, at the time Svalbard was the hardest trip I'd ever done planning wise. And it was new and everything. And I, you know, that was five years ago. So I think this was probably even a level harder than Svalbard, given the, uh, the extra the extra considerations with ice and fog and, and darkness and all the rest. And it's a trip I'm really proud of and really excited about. Oh, man, I got to tell you, Andy. <laughs> Woo, that was pretty fun. I got to tell you, we got some great stuff going on here over in. Uh, over in the chat, I don't know if you guys can. Can you see your chat there? I just pulled it up now. Yeah. Okay, we of- got some. Looks like we have some crew. Matt was on the boat there. Um, nice. Cool. Hello, Matt. Yeah. And uh, your spinnaker is bigger than my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may be crazy for swimming with the iceberg. Thanks for the great talk. That's really cool. Um, over in the Q and A, uh, people really don't know your past, but and this is uh, Andre has picked on you a little bit. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the medical condition that's there. Can you see it? Um, Andy, you touched on the question I was going to ask. How do you manage your How do you manage your stoke for being an amazing place versus your responsibilities as a skipper? You need for sleep. This relates to your story about going to sleep versus jumping in the water swimming with an iceberg. Yeah, stoke as opposed to stroke, as I assume yeah, what he yeah, meant. Yeah, I obviously misread that. I'm getting old. <laughs> Um, I'll tell you what, Andre, it's, um, oh, Bruce. Hey, nice to see you, Bruce. Um, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, it, I, you don't have to manage it. Like the, the, the excitement for this stuff. I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't ever get old and the day it gets old and the day I don't get nervous is the day I need to hang it up. I think, but I, I actually, I thought about this because I was probably, I felt when I got on the boat in Annapolis, I felt the least prepared. I think I've ever been mentally for really? a big trip like this. But I knew that I just needed to get into the routine because Annapolis to Lunenburg, I'd done that trip five times before. That was going to be easy on my nerves, at least. At Lunenburg, St. John's, a little bit harder, but I'd done it three or four times before. Um, so I could kind of conserve energy on those first two passages um, and then really rest up for Greenland. So as far as like balancing it, that's I think the real question is how do you just not not sleep like you have to manage sleep um and it, it's just having a i think having a good like my first mate vilma and james people that i can trust on the boat so when i was asleep i i didn't have to worry i was sound asleep yeah. um and and as far as managing my excitement i i i just i mean i get so excited you saw that canon video that was that was authentic man like i just have so much fun out there and greenland was like a you know a a pinnacle of my career type of trip, but I I'm like that on every trip. People that sail with me will, will know that I, I love it. It's just so cool. It's well, it's, it's so awesome. cool to be able to do it. And, and you know, y- you and I did this on the woodwind Dun- Duncan on a smaller level, but like every time, even though you're doing the same thing, it's new people each time. It is. So you're sharing that with new people who they're seeing it for the first time. So the enthusiasm is, is, uh, is um, contagious. So it's easy to stay con- enthusiastic. Bruce, I have a good uh, a good comment to that energy system. So Bruce Schwab, he um, designed our lithionics uh, battery system on Falcon. We have, I think my brain thinks in 12 volts, so we'll get technical for a second, but um, the 12 volt equivalent of 2000 amp hours of lithium battery capacity on Falcon. And to answer your question short, Bruce, it's awesome. It's amazing. The Watt and C keeps the boat topped up at sea. Um, the, the two alternators that you hooked us up with, they're putting out like, 900 amps at 12 volts equivalent um it's just stupendous however we tested the system uh and it worked as planned so what happened uh, we're sitting in that anchorage where i was swimming with the iceberg we were getting ready to leave it was four o'clock in the morning first light we go to pull the anchor up and we got a chain jam on the windlass just as the anchor got to the water line oh and man. the windlass is connected to the house battery bank the lithium bank we also have a separate agm bank that runs the engine start and the critical nav systems and that's a whole other discussion but anyway the windlass runs off the house bank and it tripped something i just assumed it tripped the breaker on the windlass and we hauled up the rest of the thing by hand and i said all right i'll fix the fix the windlass when we get 
when we get to see. So we put the main cell up, we're motoring out the fjord and all our instruments are working. Everything's working as it should. And James pops up. He goes, Hey, your whole house panels blacked out down below the oh. house bank, which is a lithium. I was like, shit. <laughs> so now point one, the system worked as planned because if there was a problem on the house side, we didn't notice it because all the critical nav stuff was running on the AGM side. So like, great, that worked, but we still had a problem. So I go down and I think it's a windless breaker, not the windless breaker. So I'm doing my troubleshooting. Turns out that the guys that installed it, they put a, the, the breaker on the windless was larger than the fuse on the BMS from the, from the lithium bank. So it gone through the breaker, this, the, the windless jam went through the breaker to the fuse pop the fuse, which as it should, did did its job. I replaced the fuse and we were back in business and away to go. Wow. Uh, away we went. So so that was so there you go, Bruce. The energy systems worked as advertised and the redundancy also worked as advertised. Very nice. Hey listen, we've got um Paul Sierra has had his hand up for a while. Paul, I have to uh, apologize. I'm not really sure how to answer that. Uh, Paul, I'd love to see your hand up. Why don't you drop us something on the uh, QA or maybe on the uh, on the chat window, okay? Paul, let's see. Where is the? Is it in the chat, or is it just to? I just see a, a raised hands over here. Ken K, really nice to see you here. Thanks for coming. This hey, is great. Ken. Sorry, I missed Ken at the boat show. To answer Cody, two alternators. No, they're both for the house. Um, again, another topic, but all the charging sources go to the house bank, and then they charge down to the start batteries via DC DC converters for the nerds out there. Um, I'm not seeing Paul's question. Um, I'm not either. I'm just in his hand. Oh. <laughs> there we go let's see Paul, Paul. Oh, gosh Paul well allow to talk sure Paul what the heck talk to me Paul are you there <laughs> well there's Paul there you go John all right well while we wait for Paul um, I'll yeah. answer some of the other questions in the chat here Robert's asking did you do any prep work in St. John's Harbor prepping for the trip um, no, all the prep work was done ahead of time. Thankfully, nothing other than provisioning. Um, I actually took three days off the boat. A friend, a former crew of ours has a house. Believe it or not, uh, Duncan, there is a town in Newfoundland called Dildo. <laughs> no. And my a former crew member has a house in Dildo. It's about an hour west of St. John. So I parked the boat and I drove out to my friend's house in Dildo for now, a couple days now, off uh, the boat. Andy, is your friend's last name Baggins? <laughs> yeah i wish okay hey, i think are we paul. hearing paul now hi paul oh looks like you've turned on your mic paul go yeah. ahead paul go ahead oh all right we're losing paul all Let's right see. hey john what do you think i think this is fantastic and and the the, the panoramic pictures and the, and the uh just the way the uh the the I've been into Namsos in Norway uh, uh, in a fjord, and, and there was nothing like this. What 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 she showed us from Greenland, and it's just amazing how how straight vertical these cliffs are that come straight up to mountain tops. Uh, just beautiful, and your descriptions too of the wildlife is is, is is fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks for having me. This is great. I'm I'm again. I'll remind you guys to follow. Uh... Follow. Look for James the Sailor Man on YouTube, and the films he made of this trip are going to be out in January. I mean, just amazing. How on earth did you manage to anchor? You you don't carry that much chain to anchor over seventy feet, do you? So, well, I have a. So we'll we'll get technical again. Um, also, um, yeah, we'll get technical again. Uh, I carry a hundred and twenty feet of chain spliced to two hundred feet of rope road. Um, for two reasons. One, it saves a little bit of weight in the bow. Uh, yeah. instead of having all chain, and two. If you're in a place like this where you need to bail in a hurry, you can cut the rope. You can fender the anchor and cut the rope and not have to worry about paying out all the chain and do you can leave in a hurry. And there's been a couple instances where we've been very close, not on this trip, but on other trips um, where we've been very close to having to bail. And I like mm -hmm. having that option to mm -hmm. bail. So when I mean, we had, um, you know, lots of scope out and what was most challenging, though, in that second anchorage by the weather station is. Not only was it 70 feet deep, but there were only these like two underwater sort of knobs of 70 feet deep. All around it was like 150 feet deep. So it's trying, it's like trying to like drop a depth charge on a submarine or something. And it took us a couple tries to hit and hold. And then it was also very disconcerting because you're on anchor and the boat now swings away and the boat step sounders reading 150 feet and oh, your anchor is yeah. in 70 feet. 
And uh, now, needless to say, in that in that spot with ice all around, we ran anchor watches at night, so somebody was always awake and on deck, yeah. um, paying attention. But, but the uh, swing must have been tremendous. Yeah, but there was no wind, so like it was, yeah. it, it would have been a different situation had there been had there been any wind. Yeah. Now, Andy, I've seen you uh, uh, do some polar bear plunges in Sweden without a dry suit. So what prompted you to use the dry suit in this case? <laughs> well, we did several several uh, plunges without dry suit. In fact, I think most of the crew all also joined us in that first anchorage. So that was for fun. But, I mean, you can't stay in for more than a few minutes. I wanted to enjoy the sights of that underwater iceberg. So I was garbed up. But I was in I was in Sans dry suit. Don't you worry. Nice to see Aram here, too, from the old schooner days. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here, Aram. You betcha. You betcha. Hey, listen, um, somebody's asked how we can get a recording of this. This uh, has been recorded all during this talk here, and it'll be both available on um, our websites, which would be GBCSR, Great Chesapeake Bay Schooner Race dot org, GCBSR, and on the American Schooner Association website, AmSchooner dot net. And I'll bet you Andy will have it on his site, too. Yeah, I'm going to stick it on our YouTube. We have a 59 North Sailing on YouTube. We don't do much there, but I'm going to put this there for everyone. That's a great idea. You know, it's interesting you're talking about your um, electric system. It's the same system I put on my boat, although I did an integral. And mm. it's just as solid as a rock. It is yeah, it's pretty cool. Just uh, Yeah, John and I sailed with that to Gloucester this summer, so it was astounding. Awesome. All right, my friends, let's take a look here uh last call for any questions and then i think we might let andy have his dinner <laughs> so i've already had my dinner but thank you for that um so bob asked if you bail and cut your anchor and chain away plan b is so uh, hopefully part of the bailing includes putting a couple fenders on the road so you can basically you know motor around until whatever is happening goes by and then you go back and retrieve the anchor we do keep a spare anchor on the boat but it's not a primary bower anchor it's a smaller kedge anchor mm -hmm. Uh, Matt Landry, who's actually on this trip with us, he's asking, what is the adventure that can top Greenland? I don't know. I mean, my, the, the thing that's always been on my radar that, that is like my, my top bucket list item. I don't really have any interest in sailing around the world just to do it, but, um, sailing around Cape Horn, doubling the horn. So going from New Zealand to, to, uh, the other side of South America nonstop. Um, that's, that's my. I, I I'm actually, I'm also not sure I actually want to do that anymore, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, that would, that would be it. That's my top thing. But I, I tell you what, Duncan, after yeah. all this stuff, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm also enjoying a lot more than ever my 34 footer on the lake in Sweden and going, going for a two hour cruise on woodwind. That's a lot more satisfying now having had all this behind me. Well, you've also got a, a son and a wife and, you know, all those things that happen as we get a little bit older. I get that. Say, sh sh they are also both sailors. Axel calls Spica our little boat in Sweden. That's Axel's boat. And nice. Mia has also Mia did her seventh transatlantic this year and uh, she and I take turns. So I'll be gone for I was gone six weeks on this trip. She was on Falcon six weeks earlier in the spring, came across the Atlantic and we're doing our first trip together since Axel was born in November. So we're going to leave Axel with her parents and we're going to finally get to sail together after four Good years. For you. Good for you. Well, look, I got one more question to ask you, my friend. And it's it's more a philosophical question. Oh, I love those. What drives you to do this? You know, there are so few people who would even want to attempt this. And I have so much respect for you because you have aimed at this over many years and achieved it. What's driving you? Well, it's appropriate timing that you asked me that question because my grandfather's funeral is on Saturday. He was 94 years old and he hasn't driven me directly, but he taught me he, he was the entrepreneur in the family and the guy that followed his passion. So my grandfather's passion was horse racing. And back in the day, you know, he wanted to, he, he was a teenager. He worked in the stalls as a groom and he worked as a photographer for some horse magazines, but he learned early on that he never wanted to be that he wanted to own and drive the horses. He wanted to be at the top of that. And he thought, well, how can I do that? Cause horse racing now, and even then is not, that's not really a business. In fact, horses cost yeah. a lot yeah. more money than sailboats. Yeah. So he said, how can I do this? So he and his dad in 1952, the year that my dad was born, started this little fast food joint mini golf course called Shells. And that's still going strong now today. My dad and his brother run it. In fact, I'm in my uncle's basement, my dad's brother's basement doing this right now to get some peace and quiet from Axel. But um, 
he so and my grandfather he became successful at the restaurant worked his ass off always had his sights set on that passion and managed to not only get horses but he was a owner driver he had stables in pennsylvania and down in florida and he was very successful in the heyday of harness horse racing back in the 70s um, i'm not sure he ever actually made any money but his horses were winning and he was doing it and i grew up that's what i grew up around i grew up around where it was just common to figure out what your passion is and work really hard to get it. So this yeah. is a this is a good little preview of what I'm going to say at his funeral on Saturday is that's that's what he taught me and I think I think where I'm lucky is I was well I'm I'm come from a great family and that's all out of my control but I'm lucky in that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And then it's just a matter of working really hard to figure out how to do that. But I never wavered in like, okay, I want to do this ocean sailing thing. That's it. And and I think that is that is where I was most lucky because I never doubted what I never doubted the passion. I knew exactly what I want to do. And the rest just falls. I couldn't help it. Well, um, it couldn't help it. The the determination that she was shown to get here is truly impressive. It really is. Hey John, have you got anything to throw in here? Um, nothing, nothing that hasn't already been covered. Thank you so much, Andy. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks to both. Thanks to both of you guys. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of fun to cross paths with both of you. John has built sales for Andy years ago, and he built my spinnaker, and now he's got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, it's been a wonderful talk. I want to thank you, and I also want to thank everybody very, very much for joining us tonight for this wonderful talk. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again next time. And Andy, have a great night. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. 